Well, hello. That little comic by Douglas Adams represents some of the facts and figures people you hear about arguing in the politics this year, and actually always. And it's one of the things is you can lie with facts and figures and statistics truthfully all the time. A lot of politicians do it. Very few don't. A lot of people will exaggerate what they're talking about to make a point. And part of the problem with statistics is that you can't truthfully lie with them. You hear about polling data and all that stuff. The problems with polling data is that unless you know how they ask the questions, when they ask the questions, the sequence they ask the questions, and all these other variables in there, statistics may be actually factual but completely wrong. Simple example, you poll everybody in the United States and say, okay, Biden will win. Well, there's more Democrats registered in the United States than there's anywhere else. 50 states, you sample all 50 of them equally. You go to California, 75, 80% are Democrats. So if you pull them equally well, you will get more representative sample of Democrats. And of course, that means he'll always win in California. If you do a statistical balancing acts saying, well, we only polled 100 people, 75 of them were Democrats, only 25 were Republicans, we'll just compensate that by increasing the weight average of the Republicans to make them like Democrats. Now, is that statistically valid? Yes. Is it probably wrong? Yes. But that's how you can lie with statistics, truthfully. Now, in the debates recently, uh, Kamala Harris said that Lincoln said he will not nominate anybody to the Supreme Court because it's too close to the election. Truthfully accurate. She left out, of course, the fact Congress wasn't in session, so he couldn't nominate anybody anyway because they weren't there until December 5th. Also, of course, it's 1864, so it's the middle of a civil war, and he's running for re-election. If he tried to announce it and tries to recall Congress, which he can't do anyway because only Congress can recall Congress, it would take a month before people get there, which means the election would be over. So it made no sense for him to try and nominate anybody because nothing could happen. He couldn't do anything anyway. If he won re-election, he'd have four months to nominate somebody. What? Four months? Back in 1865, the president wasn't sworn in until March. It's only January is recently. So therefore, he had more than enough time to nominate somebody after he had an election. And before Congress, the new Congress gets sworn in. Kamala, of course, thoughtfully left out all those probably little nice details that would show her that she was actually lying through her teeth when he said that, because he never actually did the quote either that she attributed to him on that. That's how you can lie with statistics. Like President Trump will say he's the greatest president ever. Okay, depending on what your baseline comparison is. Did he more, do more for the blacks in this country? By giving economic opportunity, he did more than Eisenhower did, definitely more than Johnson did. Johnson just basically built public housing and shoved them on the really substandard housing where they weren't used to maintaining it, ability to maintain it, or had a reason to maintain it. And therefore, that's why they've been tearing all those public housing projects from the 60s down for the last 25 years, because they failed. Now, what Trump exaggerates a lot of times, says he's the best and all this other stuff, and that's his style. People don't like it. People will get really annoyed with him, but he's actually truthfully accurate in most of the stuff he's talking about. And so therefore, you look at that statistics and how they'd lie, and you have to look at the fact checking around. A lot of the good lies in con artists rely upon people having a hint of truth before they actually make the lie. So you tell a partial truth, exaggerate, and people say, well, that's true, I know that. Now everything else is acceptable which is really hard to argue against because people all have a preconceived notion. And of course, the less people know about everything, the easier it is to lie to them. Now, back when they were founding our US Federal Republic, remember it's not a true democracy, they always said, you know, education was the key to keep an educated populace to know what's going on. Well, nowadays we have 335 million odd people in the United States Public education really doesn't teach history anymore. They kind of skip over that and say, well, that's not really important to learn about history. That's why the, the Lincoln Project and all these other things can get away the 1619 Project saying, oh gosh, America's a racist institution. When slavery was brought here, we weren't owned by ourselves. We we're owned by Great Britain, the United Kingdom, England, depending on which 
set of countries you want to throw in there at the last. I mean, they're then. How many people know that England, Great Britain, United Kingdom refer to different organizations of government within that three separate entities on there? Go look it up. You can see what I mean. England is one thing. Great Britain is another. United Kingdom is another. Now, when you're talking about England, you're talking like my map behind me up here showing the uh, airfields in the World War II. That's actually part of England. Throw in Wales, well, that's Great Britain now. United Kingdom, that means Scotland and Northern Ireland and all the possessions that the United Kingdom so owns. Crown colonies like Malta and other little places out there. So unless you understand that, well, how you're referring to it, people can go right over top of it and never realize what you're talking about. Now, like the pandemic stuff. President Trump says, you know, he's done a lot. Well, he has. And of course, he ignored a lot of the people who were giving him advice back then. It's a flu, but it's not contagious. Wait a second, all flus are contagious. Flus, by definitions, are airborne. So you only have a flu that's airborne. The Chinese said, oh, it's not airborne. It's you know, spread through like contaminants like E. coli through food. Well, then how would people who never went there be sick? So on a bald face, it's a lie. Now, of course, China kept people out of there so they wouldn't do it. The one Chinese doctor who reported died of it. And of course, that means one in 100,000 chance of him dying from that. He's a doctor. He's got all these medicines. He's used to contagious disease. Yeah, he died of it. He's prime of his life, unlikely. But there again, when you come to the United States and say, well, gosh, it's that all the experts are saying, well, it's not really contagious. It's not here. We can get over it. Of course, they were being lied to by the World Health Organization. He actually did you know, travel bans from China before anyone else wanted to. They actually recommended against it. Following the science, don't ban it. There's no reason for it. Don't ban travel from the United Kingdom and England and oh, France and Italy. Well, how did Italy get hit so hard? There's 20,000 Chinese that worked there traveling, traveling to and from China all the time. They brought it with them to Italy. They didn't know about it. They contaminated Italy. People from Italy and during tourist areas, where it's the main ports coming back from uh, Europe, New York City, Newark, New Jersey, a little bit of Orlando. And so they came here before they realized it. And then we put the travel ban in. Now, following the science, Biden would never oppose a travel ban because the science says you don't need to do that. Remember, this is in March when everybody said you were being xenophobic. Biden said you're xenophobic, you're racist. He wasn't. He ignored his own advisors and said, we need to do this because it's bad. Now, how bad is it? Well, it was bad, but they didn't report in that only out of all those people in nursing homes, well, 35 people in nursing homes died. How many of the staff? None. Oh, wait a second, 60 died over here. How many of the staff? Oh, they're sick, none died. Did the press report the fact that it only seems to be affecting very old people with underlying condition who are in nursing homes and not really the staff? Some staff people have died but they were also about the same age group, underlying medical conditions, working in there. They all did, and remember, back in, oh, it's not contagious, it's not airborne. So it got here, spread around, but Biden would follow the science. There'd be a whole bunch over there. There again, here's another science statistic. When they published, they said 2.2 million Americans would die with this. That's a standard distribution curve as if everybody's affected the same. That means from the very young to the very old, anybody who got it, they had the same mortality rate. You don't hear the mortality rate being reported. They just said new cases. Well, okay, you have 70,000 new cases. Do they report how many people were tested? Then they said, well, it's only a 4% positivity rate. Well, 4%, 70,000 people. If you people can still do the math, you look at that, that means they've tested, what, half a million people that day in order to get that's 70,000 people. I'm off on that. But there's a the whole thing. They don't report how many people are tested. Now, in 10 days, you test 500,000 people. That's 5 million people. In 20 days, that's 20, That's how many people now? Count up. That means in 30 days or so, you can have half the population been tested. But the positivity rate's still the same. Mortality rate's more important. They don't report that. There again, if you actually just lock down the United States, 
and only those people over 65 or the people have pre-existing conditions and all that, let everybody else go along there. True, some people would die in that below 65 age group who are perfectly healthy, maybe one in four million. Okay, now is that worth the risk or worth setting? Everybody, you're out of job, your house gets repossessed because you can't pay a mortgage, but that's more important to Joe Biden because it's don't have anybody die. I mean, in, in, when you're studying diseases, you really want to have zero people die. Impossible, but that's what their goal is. Nobody die whatsoever. The people who do that are not the people who run the country or not people who have jobs. Notice none of those people are out of a job. They're still working with full pay. Everybody else though is shut, shut in and out of work. Now, when President Trump said, okay, I'm not shut down the thing, you gotta shut everybody down. Every single government said, no, 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 you can't do that. We're a republic, you have no control of that, which is true. He controlled the federal government personnel and the military personnel. He is a republic, so therefore he can't order the governors to do anything. The only time he does, is he declare martial law in any of those cities. When, he, when the governor said that we don't wanna do that, then he tried to say, okay, well, I will do that. Then they put back and said, okay, we will do what we want. And from the last pandemic, which Joe Biden was in charge of and 70 million people got infected, but he never talked about that part of it. And it took six months before they actually declared a pandemic in the United States and a medical health crisis. The governors say, we will do this. And they actually implemented law to prevent that from happening again. And of course, through those intervening eight years, nobody replenished any of the gowns, masks, or any of the other stuff because it's not important. It'll never, it'll never happen again. And it's not going on my watch. So I don't have to worry about spending money on it. So of course they didn't. So when this pandemic came in and said, we need all this stuff, the national stocks pile supplies that we supposed to add, not in there because Obama and Biden said, it's not important enough to use our money to do that. So we're not gonna restock it. So they didn't. Now the governors say, okay, on our pandemic rules, we didn't declare anything you want. So they did, we, you can't go to work. We just business shut down. We're not doing this to these health things. People meet the health criteria. Oh, we don't want you opening back up anyway. Oh, the limits down low. No, we don't want you opening up because we were lowering the curve. Lowering the curve meant actually making sure the hospitals are not overwhelmed. Once they're not overwhelmed, open back up. Most governors, and especially in Northern states and the Democrat controlled one, didn't want to do that. I mean, you still can't go to Disneyland in California because, oh, we're so worried about getting it. Now, if 70 million people got it and 200,000 died, yeah, that's really bad for those 200,000 people. If you isolate those 200,000 people and say, you cannot go anywhere anymore, you can't go out of your house, no one can visit you unless they do a complete chemical protocols of protecting you. And for the next year and a half, you're stuck at home and you cannot do anything whatsoever, those 200,000 people will be alive. They'll probably kill themselves or have other mental problems or health problems because they can't go to the hospitals and all that stuff, but they will be safe. Now, the other population that is healthy that may get sick and recover within a week and a half to two weeks, some may have long-term health events, they'll go on with their lives. Now, in the 1918 pandemic, 775,000 people died in the United States. We we're fighting a war in Europe. So what's the more important, shutting down the economy and saving people here or winning the war? Well, it was obviously winning the war because the Democrat President Wilson said, we're not gonna shut this down. A few places did shut down and it was actually worse when they shut it down than was it leaving it open. And also that pandemic's a little bit different. The healthier you are, the more chances are you died. The youngest people, the healthiest, your body overreacted and killed you. Now, if you're very young or very old, your body didn't overreact to the influenza and most of those people actually survived. The highest mortality rate was the 25 to 35 year old crowd. And it also happens to be like most of the soldiers. And like everything else, it's called the Spanish flu because everybody else had news blackouts on, didn't report the people were getting sick, only Spain didn't. So the reporters in Spain knew about it, it's called the Spanish flu and it went around the world. Now, hair, we are in the Wuhan, China flu, because it originated there. Now, this case is different. It isn't the only place where it was reported. It's where it's actually started. And of course, Chinese disinformation campaign tries to say the United States planted it there, which is false. And of course, they did things saying it was actually a virus like E. coli and spread through human contact through food, which was also false, and they knew it. So 
anyway, that's again lying with statistics on there. Oh, this is this way. Unless you can prove the statistics how they do it, can't do it. And that's what a good con artist do. Lie with statistics. Say a little truth, a big lie. No one knows anything about the difference or can't look it up, and it gets believed. Like Biden says, if I get elected, I will do all this stuff about you know, what P PPE equipment, free uh, vaccinations, free testing, rapid testing. We're already actually doing that. My wife and I went out and had a test. It took them about four days to get the results back, and they had to call us up and tell us. And of course, one of the things you find out about this stuff, if you're negative, they won't bother calling you. They just do a best effort. If they get to you, they do, they don't. They only keep trying if you're positive. So how many people are out there have been tested multiple times? I mean, the White House, 1,000 people get tested there probably every day there, going there. That's where they're using a lot of the rapid tests at. Biden says, we all do all this stuff. Trump's already did all that stuff. And of course, Trump was also put behind a little bit of the eight ball because our CDC messed up their first set of tests. So for a whole month of testing, trying to make a rapid test, they messed up their own testing procedures, failed, and had to start all over again. So for a whole month, they couldn't be anything. Now, people say, oh, gosh, we can do it faster. Well, the FDA, the rules, all this stuff have very much laid out what you can and how fast you can do it, regulatory reviews, processes, and all this stuff. And so you look at that and going, oh, I'll do it faster. He didn't do it fast the first time he had it. When the swine flu hit here, he messed that up really big time. And as was mentioned last year, somebody on his staff said, we just got real lucky. It wasn't virulent as we thought it would be. And we did everything wrong. And of course, Biden's still the person who was running that thing. He did everything wrong. Did he learn from that? No, not a bit. He got out of it and said, well, I didn't do anything. That's all right. That's, no one's going to know about this stuff. That's why we didn't have the test equipment and all this other protective gear that we we're supposed to have had in the stockpile because him and Obama, President Obama, former President Obama, didn't do anything about it. So you, when you think about hearing statistics on TV and what they're doing, you have to dig into the facts behind it. And it's easier nowadays to dig into facts, but it takes time. And when you listen to reports on the various news branches, and I go, I flip through all the different channels, listen to how things are reported. It's very interesting how they're, you can see how they're slanted. Newspaper slant reporting, that's nothing new. I mean, the Hearst newspaper chain had a one view of thing, and the Tribunes and New York Times had another view of everything. I mean, that's how we got in the Spanish-American War. He says, well, gosh, I'll send you to, the, to Cuba, and I'll make sure we get the war. And we did. When the main blew up, they blamed the Spanish, even though there's most likely a coal explosion on that, and actually it was a pure accident, but he used that, created a thing, ripped up hysteria, and we went to war, and it was reluctant war. McKinley didn't want to do it. But there again, you have bias on there. Bias is everywhere. And the first stringer out in the field says, I think this is a good story. Who says, I, and he looks at another story, says, I don't think that's a good story. Automatic bias, he thinks what is a good story, what isn't a good story. Goes up the next layer and gets to the distribution wire and they say, ah, I don't like that story. So it never gets sent on. Or it says, I like that story, it gets on. It gets promoted, promoted, and gets filtered all the way up. So by the time you actually see it in a newspaper, it's probably been filtered four or five times by various people saying, I like this story, I don't like it. Now, people in newspapers say they're you know, unbiased. They just report the news. They don't create the news. Well, if you look at different news channels, and a lot of people can't look at it unless you have cable and you flip back and forth a lot, you don't see the bias, how they report it. It's the words, phrases, intonations, and even facial expressions, how they do it, and how they read it. Now, when you see four different networks all reporting almost exactly word for word the same thing, you're pretty well sure that all of them are coordinating or biasing against one person or a group of people. It's like when the quote from President Trump when he's talking to Charlotte, he was talking about the statues. Okay, there are people arguing for tearing it down and for people arguing not to tear it down. Good people on both sides. And it's been repeated by Kamala Harris, Biden, and many other Democrats that he's talking about the people who are protesting. It wasn't that at all. But see, there again, they take a partial fact turn it into a lie, unless people check on it, you never know it was a lie. There's a lot of things like that throughout history. That's one thing I love about history. It's like when I took statistics, unbeknownst to me, my ex-warrant officer 
who was a maintenance officer, signed up for the same class in statistics. And we had fun with the teacher. We'd go up there and ask him questions that he would never think about. He'd look at that in the class and go, I never thought about that. I have to get back with you on that. So Don Newman and I, we had a lot of fun in that class, just like my speech presentation class. Our teacher would go up there and say, here's a topic. You have to give a two minute presentation on this speech. No idea what it was gonna be. Sometimes it was impromptu in the class. Sometimes you had like a week to prepare for it to give a, your speak and somebody would counter argue it. Fun, but the, nowadays a lot of these people who are campaigning have staffs to do all the research. And it's like Kamala Harris's staff, purposely picked that Lincoln out, left it out of context, put no, no facts around it so they understand why he said all that. And it says, oh gosh, President Trump shouldn't have rushed through this nomination. And then they also say he's packing the court by uh, doing constitutionally required and obligated and allowed nominations to the Supreme Court. And of course, packing the court actually is saying, we have the nine justices, we're gonna increase to 13 or maybe 15, and we'll get a point to four or six people that we want on there, and they're calling it rebalancing the court. It's rebalancing in their favor, which is what tyrants usually do when they want to take over, is they get rid of the judiciary, point their people in there, put a law in there, and people say, yeah, that's legal. So, you know, you think about what Biden wants to do, and if he gets all, you know, both houses of Congress and the presidency, he will pack the court because he won't be able to say no because the people and Congress will pass the law. You think he's gonna go up there and say, I'm gonna veto this law because I think it's wrong about expanding the Supreme Court? Huh, no way is he gonna do that. The people would never stand for it. So if they win both houses, the court will be packed. Of course, that means anything coming in through the process right now will always be overridden and go into their favor because after all, they packed the court now. So everything they say that they want and what they've never been able to get through legally on the Congress side, they'll get through on the, uh, the um, judicial side and say, well, Congress got it wrong. This is legal. This is legal. I mean, there's a lot of things they can do. Let's like Biden said, I will not ban fracking. Technically, he can't ban fracking. You go in there and you write an executive order saying we will not allow permits on any federal land, which is actually a ban. And he qualified himself, so I'm going to stop it on federal land, but most fracking doesn't occur on federal land. He can go in there and say, okay, EPA, rewrite the rules. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, we didn't like your environmental impact statement. Redo it. Until then, you're all, all fracking is suspended until you do a new environmental impact statement. He can get Congress to say, okay, we don't up your uh, deposit $20 million before you can do a fracking. We'll keep it for 10 years in case there's no groundwater contamination or earthquakes, which people say is caused by fracking also. So he can take the powers in government, the way the laws are actually written. Congress passes a law, the, the diverse departments write the regulations to enforce the law, and they can pretty well write that anywhere they want to get, enforce the law. And he can have like, you know, 90 days later, hey, I want this law changed, publish a not notice in the Federal Registry, nine days uh, listen to a public comment, which, of course, public comment is meaningless because they can ignore any public comments. And they said, we don't think about this comments. We don't care about it. We're gonna pass this law anyway. Make it, put it in the Federal Register, becomes law uh, because there's a regulation and it's done. And nothing can be done about it. Oh, you can appeal it. Appeal it to the Supreme Court they just packed, which that means everything they don't do is gonna be auto approved anyway. That's how tyrants start. That's how a, actually communist or socialist dictatorships actually start. A lot of little things like that. And most of this stuff, people never have time to think about because they are busy doing their life, unless they have a person like me who actually love history. It's like, you know, unintended consequences or sometimes intended consequences. Why is there a veterans administration, a veterans and a GI bill? Didn't really care about educating people. It was to make sure there was no post-war depression after World War II. Give these people money to go to college. Four to six years later, those people finally get to the workforce. So the four to six years, those 12 million people who are in the military, none of them come back, flood the labor market, cause an economic depression because there's not enough employment. It delayed the employment of people coming back. Unintended consequences, of course, all the people went to college. Colleges had to expand, hire more people. So some of those people who came back from the war now had new jobs in the universities, maintenance, buildings, everything else 
tiptoeing around that because four to six million people did not come back to the workforce. They went to college. Unintended consequences by planning, because that's part of the things I found, read about when I was doing research on U-boats. This was part of the discussions going on in one of the things about how to hunt U-boats. They brought up this. I'm going, what? What is this from? You don't hear about that. There again, it's not that fact they didn't they hit it. They hit it as policy that was hidden. Just like Biden says that he's not going to answer any policy question because as he said on the reporter, you have no reason to know what my policies are. So, you know, they always talk about what they want to do, not what they really are going, going to do. So when this election cycle comes up in another nine days, think about that. You know, what Trump, he's rough, he's gruff, he says what he means. Biden and Kamala Harris, the senator from California, they hide. Remember, a prosecutor, she's a prosecutor. He goes to grand juries. And there again, she, they may have been lying about what grand juries do. Unless you've been on it, which I have, unfortunately, which was a week of my life going there, listening to all this stuff. It's a prosecutor who come in saying, this is what happened. Does this actually make the level of the law saying he actually committed a crime? There is no defense witnesses. There's nothing about that. That's all the prosecution saying, if we take this to a court, do we think we have enough to actually charge him with a crime? Does it meet the criteria of a crime? Yes or no? That's all a grand jury does. Listen to the prosecutor. He gives them his facts. Remember, there's no defense facts. Says, this is what we know happened. And this is what we can prove what they did. Does that meet the level of the law saying as a crime occurred? Kamala Harris you know, knows that doesn't talk about that part, nor does all the defense attorneys, everybody else in there, or all the other legislators saying, oh, this was a crime. He should be, the district attorney should release all this stuff because there's no defense stuff. Grand juries, there is never a defense stuff. It's always prosecutional. And the prosecution nowadays have to turn all their stuff over to the defense attorneys who they can go out and do investigations to determine, yes, is that true? Or, oh, no, that's not really quite true. And you can prove it. And in the politician state, especially in this year, 2020, it's a lot harder to do all that investigative reporting, unless some of the networks, they don't bother doing those reporting because that doesn't fit their narrative of what they want done. So anyway, think about all that. Thanks.